Hey y'all, happy Advent, happy almost Christmas if you celebrate. Um, even if you don't, welcome, it's cool to have you here. Um, so for this Advent season, the past few weeks, I have been super fixated on Luke chapter 2, um, the nativity story told there. Um, and particularly the little bit in verse 7 where the gospel writer says that um, after Mary gives birth to Jesus, she wraps him in swaddling cloths and lays him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Um, if you know the nativity story at all, if you've seen the Peanuts Charlie Brown Christmas special, if you've driven past a church that has a nativity scene out on its lawn, you probably know how the story goes, that Jesus was born in a stable, a barn, and laid in a manger um, because, you know, there is some innkeeper who says, hey, sorry, no vacancy, the hotel's all full up but you could stay in the stable if, if you need somewhere to give birth to a baby. That seems like a fine place for it. Um, and I personally have always really loved this nativity story from a liberationist perspective. So the idea that God focuses, God has a special care for the most oppressed and marginalized people in the world um, because they need care the most, right? And so the fact that God, in the person of Jesus, was born into the margins of the margins, right? That human beings didn't make space for him in their normal life, that he had to be born in the outskirts, in a barn, um, has really resonated with me for a long time. And therefore, last year, when I stumbled across a an article from The Guardian, um, where the author claims that Jesus might not have been born in a stable after all, that he might actually have been born in somebody's house, a peasant house in Bethlehem, it really kind of unsettled me. It threw me for a loop. Um, and I think that's just normal, right? When there's a story that we hold dear and we find out that we've potentially been reading it wrong, um, that's a, an unsettling thing. So, as I want to do, I did my own research, right? I looked into the, the Greek of the text myself, and I also did a lot of praying and reading and all of that. Um, for this video, I'm not going to go into um, sort of the theological stuff I've concluded. I wrote a lot of poems, and like I said, I did a lot of praying. This video is not going to talk about that. I actually talk about that in a blog post essay type thing over on my WordPress blog, which I'll link, and I also talk about it in a podcast episode, which I'll also link in, in the video notes here. Um, but for now, I'm not going to tell you too much about how um, digging into the Greek and coming to, and, and the cultural context and um, sort of scholarly sources that talk about how, yeah, Jesus may not have been born in a stable. He might have been born in somebody's house. Um, how I've come to see that that's also really exciting from a liberationist perspective in different ways. Um, this video is not about that as much. This is uh, one of my Bible Tools Tour videos where I show you how even if you don't have the time, the resources, the money, whatnot, to learn Biblical Greek yourself, you can still, using free online resources, look into the Bible the biblical Greek yourself. Um, and also in this video, I'm going to also really focus on how you can find scholarly articles for yourself for free online, even if you don't have access to JSTOR or other scholarly sort of libraries of texts, you can still find and read scholarly um, articles. So that's what we're talking about today, and that's what we're doing in this video. And it gets kind of long, but stick with it as long as you want to. If you only want to watch me um, show you where to go to look at the Greek um, and what it what it says about this word, usually translated as in, um, stay for that. If you want to watch me find scholarly articles and read through a couple of them with you, Watch that part. Watch the whole thing. It's up to you how much you want to how much you want to stick around for. I just figured I'd put it all up here. So yeah, we're gonna start with the Greek, um, and particularly that word usually translated as "in," which is the Greek word "kataluma," um, in Luke chapter two, verse seven. So 
That's where we're headed first. Does it really say in? Are there other translation options? Why does it matter? How does it influence how we read the story? Let's go. So if you have watched one of these videos before, you probably know where I'm going to take you. And it's, uh, for me, I just do a shortcut of Googling Luke 2 and then the word interlinear. And the first result is Bible Hub, which is where I wanted to head. Um, and interlinear means that um, the Greek manuscripts and the some English um, underneath is what you'll what will show up. So that's what that is. And while I'm there, I also want to go visit um, Net Bible, also called Lumina.com. Uh, head over to Luke over here as well, Luke chapter two, and and see see what we can see. Um, and yeah, usual disclaimer that just because I use these two resources does not mean that I am on board with all the viewpoints of the people who create them. Um, if you know of anything similar to Bible Hub or Net Bible that is made by uh, progressive Christians that is free, please let me know. But in the meanwhile, this is what I'm using. So, so yeah, go to verse 7. It could be fun to look at various things that, um, for instance, if we go a little earlier to verse 6, the came to pass in their being there, she fulfilled the days of, like, basically, it doesn't say that she gives birth right when they arrive, so that's something interesting. Um, but yeah, let's keep it simple. Look at this word, katalumati. Um, you might be like, hey, that's slightly different. The ending's different. That's because of the part of speech. Uh, Greek, like a lot of languages, um, has different endings for different parts of speech and stuff, um, whether things are singular or plural, whether they're direct objects or subjects. And in this case, the information here tells us that katalumati uh, is in the dative, which means an indirect object, um, Nouns get gendered, so neuter is the gender of this word, and it's singular. There's just one in, right? And also good to note is that it's the in. This is the direct article, the, also in the dative, neuter, singular. And the reason it's dative is because the preposition in takes the dative. Um, yeah, all this stuff that might be making your head swim, but um, just so you, like, just to explain why it looks slightly different, but once you do, once you do what I always advise, which is to go up to the little number above the word you want to look deeper at, the number corresponds to uh, the entry number in Strong's Concordance. So that's all that means. And here you'll see the word kataluma, um, the the sort of base of the word, if it were the subject of a sentence and singular and all of that, it would be kataluma. And so that's why when we talk about it in English, we just say kataluma, even if in the place we're looking at, it's a different part of speech. And let's see what the sort of most basic definition is. A lodging place. Usage and in lodging place. Well, that doesn't seem exhaustive, now does it? Oh, hey, look, an exhaustive concordance. How nice. Um, it's also not that exhaustive, but it does offer another translation option. Instead of in, we can also say guest room, and it gives us a word origin. Um, so where did kataluma come from? It says, oh, another Greek word. And so we'll go to that, and we'll see that kataluo, it looks very similar, right? Kataluo is a verb. So we're looking at the noun. This is the verb form, and it literally means to loosen thoroughly. Weird, huh? It comes from kata and luo, and together the luo is the loosen part, and so loosen completely. And it can mean destroy or overthrow, but what would that have to do with uh, an inn, a guest room, any of that? Well, if we look at the usage, we see this second option instead of just overthrowing or destroying. I unyoke, unharness a carriage, horse, or pack animal. Hence, I put up, lodge, find a lodging. So basically, this verb has to do with if you're stopping long enough that you have to like get your animals ready to settle down for the night, you can use this verb. And so we can see the link to the noun as uh, it really is a lodging place, whether that is a hotel type place or a guest room. So that's fun. 
and then we have another dictionary that it gives the the entry from and this one suggested also suggests in lodging place eating room dining room guest chamber so lots of options and if you go down here you'll see another sort of origin reason so I, uh, I suggested that it's about because you have to settle your animals down unyoke them um, but what strong suggests is being sort of um, untied and, and all of that is the journey you're breaking up the journey um, and settling in so yeah this idea that sometimes we don't know exactly how words came to be that's true when you're looking at word origins in any language so it, it's kind of fun to um, just see to me at least it's fun I love etymology I love seeing where words come from and how they connect to each other so um, so yeah a, a dining room that's interesting right um, if in English, at least, there's a big difference between, like, a guest room, um, where we let, you know, we say, hey, here's the guest room, it's got the bed, you can sleep in here, but then there's a different room where you all sit down, you know, the kitchen or the dining room. These are different rooms in our world. So, why can the same word be either in the Greek? Well, that's when looking at this section of this web page comes in handy. This Englishman's Concordance will show you every usage of this noun in the entire New Testament of the Bible. Um, sometimes this column can go really long, and in other videos you'll see words. So, you know, if it's the if it's the word to go, it's gonna be a mile long because that word comes up a lot. But it looks like kataluma only comes up three times in the entire Bible. We have where we're looking, Luke 2, 7. We have Mark 14, 14, so we'll want to check that out. And we have Mark, and we have Luke 22, 11. So let's look at Mark first, see how uh, the Gospel of Mark makes use of this word. So when you click on the link, it sends you to this kind of freaky page. So I always go up to an English version. And we go to 14, 14. So we see we're at the last Passover story, so much later in Jesus' life, he's a grown man, right? He's getting ready to have the Last Supper, and he's telling his disciples to go into the city, follow this person, wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? So that's Kataluma here. Um, you may have heard that that this um, people will talk about the upper room where Jesus had his last supper. It's the same noun as whatever place has no space for Mary to give birth to Jesus. Um, so he has an upper room, a guest room, a kataluma, where he has his last supper. He was not born in a kataluma because there wasn't room. So yeah, just that's what we see in Mark. And then let's go over to Luke 22. So this is the same author who wrote Luke chapter 2, is also the author of Luke 22, right? So, so it will definitely be cool to see another instance of how the same author makes use of this noun elsewhere um, to get an idea of what his own sort of personal idea of this noun's meaning is. So we go over to verse 11. Oh, and it's also in this same time frame, right, where Jesus is talking about preparing the Passover, um, and it's, so it's the same story as told in Mark, just, you know, slightly different wording. Follow this person into the house he enters. You shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room? Uh, kind of interesting, my versus the. But yeah, where's the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upstairs room. Prepare it there. So, yeah, definitely not an inn, right? So the same author who supposedly wrote um, in the Nativity story earlier in his text that there's no place for them in the inn, and that's uh, the word kataluma, now is using that same word kataluma to mean guest room or an upper room, a place to eat, a dining room. Um, those are quite different, quite different meanings. Would the same person use the same noun for very different, um, with very different meanings? Possibly. Um, like, sure, why not? He could. Um, but it does raise that question, especially if you know that there's another word in Greek, in Biblical Greek, for an inn. Um, so that's 
So this is a matter of you just have to know it here. Maybe you know, well, surely there is somewhere else in the New Testament where an actual in is mentioned if this word doesn't have to mean in. And in in two of the three usages, it's definitely not an in. Why would it be in the third? Um, so, so you can search up here for the word in, and you're going to see kataluma. But first, you're going to see a different word, pandokeon, is how I think I would say it. Even pandokeon. Anyway, <laughs> what on earth is a con? Well, an inn or a hotel. And so, and this is in Luke. So again, we've got the same author as the, the supposed inn in the nativity story and also the upper room with the Last Supper story. Um, if Luke does use the word kataluma to mean inn as well as a guest room or a dining room, well, why in Luke 10, when he wants to talk about an inn, why doesn't he use kataluma here again? Um, instead, he, he uses this other Greek word for an inn. So let's check out what story that is. It's the Good Samaritan. So, you know, there's a, a guy who is beat up really badly, and a Samaritan comes, bandages up this guy's wounds, um, puts him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So instead of using kataluma here, the author of Luke uses a completely different noun. So for me, and a lot of the scholars will look at, that's sort of a hint that we maybe shouldn't be translating the Luke chapter 2 kataluma as in, that it means something else to the writer of the Gospel of Luke. So let's, um, before we start looking at more articles to see what scholars say, let's head on over to Lumina slash NetBible. Um, and just check out their footnotes on this story. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in strips of cloth. Strips of cloth, traditionally swaddling cloths. Strips of linen wrapped around the arms. Okay, that's great. In a manger or a feeding trough. Also cool, great. There was no place for them in the inn. Now let's see what the commentary says. There is no drama in how this is told. There is no search for a variety of places to stay or a heartless innkeeper. Such items are later non-biblical embellishments. Bethlehem was not large and there was simply no other place to stay. The humble surroundings of the birth are ironic in view of the birth's significance. Okay, so I appreciate that they point out that um, the sort of story we might expect, thanks to you know how it's been told later, is not there. And then it um, gives us the translator's note. This is great. The Greek word kataluma is flexible, and usage in the LXX, which means the Septuagint, which is um, a uh, Greek version of what we call the Old Testament, um, which you know was written most of which was written originally in Hebrew, and then a few centuries before Jesus was born was translated by Jewish people. Um, it's their it's their book. Jewish people. Um, in the diaspora realized, oh, hey, we, uh, a lot of our people speak Greek as their first language now, so we really need to translate our scriptures into Greek. So that's what the LXX, the um, Septuagint, is. And it has, so you'll find Old Testament stuff that's written in Greek, it uses this word kataluma. Um, anyway, this Greek word refers to a variety of places for lodging. Most likely, Joseph and Mary sought lodging in the public accommodations in the city of Bethlehem, and they do cite a source, which would have been crude shelters for people and animals. However, it has been suggested by various scholars that Joseph and Mary were staying with relatives in Bethlehem, and they give us some places to look. If that were so, the term would refer to the guest room in the relative's house, which would have been filled beyond capacity with all the other relatives who had to journey to Bethlehem for the census. So this is a, just a good time to indicate, like, like to point out that when translators' notes in any resource are written sort of like as sort of confident fact, like the most likely versus it has been suggested, like some, like we, we just because they say most likely doesn't have to mean it's the most likely option. It's just, it's the one they like to lean towards. After looking at various resources, I would... If I had a pick, if I had a bet, I would bet on 
what they're sort of implying is the less likely scenario, I would say, is the more likely. Um, so I wouldn't, I'm not comfortable with saying flat out it's most likely, but just, yeah, so a reminder when you're using a resource like this, just because they state it with confidence and even with cited sources doesn't mean that it's definitely the facts, right? And also, they say flat out, like, that if it's a guest room, what happened is all the other relatives who journeyed to Bethlehem filled it. Um, they state that with confidence when we look at future articles in a moment. That doesn't have to be the only reason that Luke would say such a guest room is full. Or, or and he doesn't even say full. He says, there is no room in the Kataluma. So, so yeah, again, stated with confidence, but that doesn't have to be the whole story just because of, just because of that. Alrighty, so now that we've looked at the Greek ourselves, it's time to see what scholars have to say. Um, today, I'll start with Google Scholar. Um, Google Scholar is basically one step up from just Googling. Um, it, the, the search results won't be your standard web pages. It will be scholarly works, things that have been published for the most part, right? Let's start by typing in Luke 2 and Kataluma. Um, if there's a specific word in Greek or Hebrew or, or whatever that you want to really hone in on, typing the English transliteration into the search bar is a good way to find stuff that is specifically digging into that Greek or Hebrew word. Here's our results, and you can sort of refine your search. You can make it so it only shows you more recent stuff. Um, but let's start with the first result, an improbable end, texts and traditions surrounding Luke 2-7 by Andy Mickelson. Um, it shows sort of what university accredited this person, where it was published, and if you want to know more about a student journal for the study of the ancient world, fun. So you know sort of off the bat, this person's probably a student, but a student who is in the process of learning and this is sort of peer-reviewed before it was published, so that's nice. You know, um, Andy Mickelson didn't just type it up and publish it on their own. It's from 2015. And what I, what I love to see, you can read the whole dang thing for free. Um, I'm going to dig into it more in a little bit. Spoiler alert, this is one of my favorite free accessible things I found. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely go back to that. But let's see what, what else we got. Hmm. Oh, look. You can't access it. Well, if I really wanted, if there was some reason that I thought this is something I really want to look at, I could search for it somewhere else. So time for a new resource that I think y'all are going to love because I love it. Um, and honestly, like, this is, it's so good. In a stable born our brother. Oh, hey, look at that. I can download it. Yay. It's the whole thing that this place was going to make me log in um, to a, a university, which I'm not a student anymore, so I don't have that, and I'm not a professor, um, or pay $37.50 for, for only 25 hours. Wow, that's ridiculous. So, huh, silly, silly, silly. Not doing that. I can just read it on here, which is nice. My sort of thing is I'm like, what is the expository times? If I'm not going to do it for this video, but I would absolutely want to look into what is this resource? What am I even looking at right now? But for now, and like I would want to look into this person before I was citing this all over. But I do like, um, it looks like it's a, an article review, right? Of an article about Dr. Kenneth Bailey. Look at this. This article is saying, I maintain that Dr. Bailey's thesis about the place of Jesus' birth is wrong. Um, that in Luke 2, 7, this person wants to argue, Kataluma can be rendered as in with reasonable accuracy. 
So, if you want a resource that argues against Kataluma um, as anything but an N, here's where you can go. Yay! And you can get it online for free thanks to beautiful Z Library. Love these guys. I'm going to search for Kenneth Bailey because the name of his book comes up in quite a few resources that I looked at, um, that I found on Google Sky Scholar and all of that, um, or in the links in that Guardian article. Um, Kenneth Bailey's book, and let's see if they've got it. Not the Paul one. Jesus Through Mediterranean Eyes. <sighs> Look at that. They have it. And you can download it for free. It's 443 pages, so, so just be aware of that um, when you download it. That is pretty long, <laughs> and we only want one piece of it, right? Um, but anyway, you can download it for free, which I did, um, and set it so that it comes to me through Firefox. You can download it like into um, your ebook app or whatever. Um, but I start by just going right to... The contents and, oh, well, hey, nice. Starts right with the birth of Jesus. That's where we want to go. Luke 2, 1 through 20. That's our section. Oop. And so it jumps us forward to page 20, it looks like, the story of Jesus' birth. The traditional events of the Christmas story are well known to all Christians. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, but, but yeah, just saying, we need to re examine what the Bible. Con contains and what is sort of traditional add-ons. Yep, yep. Um, so here's the flaws he notes um, in how the like how tradition has formed around this Luke story. One, Joseph was returning to the village of his origin. In the Middle East, historical memories are long, and the extended family with its connection to its village of origin is important. In such a world, a man like Joseph could have appeared in Bethlehem and told people, I am Joseph, son of Hell, son of son of Mahat, son of Levi, and most homes in town would be open to him. Two, Joseph was a royal, that is, he was from the family of King David. The family of David was so famous in Bethlehem that local folk apparently called the town the City of David. So I'm not going to read it all, but he sort of names... Uh, reasons for why our traditional understandings are you know not accurate and for instance that joseph had time to make adequate arrangements that while they were there in judea um basically that the average christian thinks jesus was born the same night that they arrive in bethlehem um but that's not necessarily you know that's not what the text specifies or anything so where did all of this come from and so he talks about how the misinterpretation stems from approximately 200 years after the birth of jesus when an anonymous christian wrote an expanded account of the birth of jesus that has survived and it's called the protevangelium of james um and what this author claims is that whoever wrote this apocryphal book didn't understand Palestinian geography or Jewish tradition. Um, and so just sort of a lot of the stuff imagined in this text, including that uh, Joseph leaves Mary in a cave and rushes off to Bethlehem to find a midwife. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, this is really, it's interesting, but um, that the average Christian who has never heard of this book is unconsciously influenced by it. That's interesting. He goes on to explain what uh, a home in a village like Bethlehem uh, would look like. It would usually just have two rooms, and one of those rooms was exclusively for guests. Um, and so the main room would be where the family cooked, ate, slept, and lived. Um, and then each night into that same area, the family cow, donkey, and a few sheep would be driven. Every morning, those animals were taken out and tied up in the courtyard of the house. The animal stall would then be cleaned for the day. So that explains why there's a manger in that that main room where Mary ends up giving birth. There's not there's not room in that that guest room. The, extra smaller guest room for her to give birth either because it's full of people or it's just too small 
So instead she gives birth in the same room that people would do all their living in and the animals would sleep in at night. Here's a nice diagram of family living room. And so yeah, that there would be mangers dug out in this living room area. Oh, cool. And yeah, so there'd be a slip. Yeah, so it, it goes into detail, which is really fun. All right, so moving a little long, further into this chapter, um, the question is, um, in Luke 2, 7, when it says there's no room in the inn, let's look at what that means. So most people understand it says that um, no room for them in the inn sounds as if they were rejected by the people of Bethlehem. Was that really the case? There's a trap in traditional language. No room in the inn has taken on the meaning of the inn had a number of rooms and all were occupied. The no vacancy sign was already switched on when Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem. But the Greek word does not refer to a room in an inn, but rather to a space, topos, as in there is no space on my desk for my new computer. Yeah, so the that word topo, it's, um, there's no room on my desk, not literal a room like a bedroom or a family room or any of that. There's just no space, not a place. Um, so yeah, that's, that's good to know. The Greek word in Luke 2, 7 that is commonly translated in is katalama. This is not the ordinary word for a commercial inn. So yeah, we've looked at this then. The um, Good Samaritan story. Literally, a katalama is simply a place to stay. So yeah. Um, then looking at the Upper Room uh, Last Supper stories like we did. And then it says that Christianity in the Middle East has traditionally focused on the birth having taken place in a cave. Many simple homes and traditional villages in the Holy Land begin in caves and are then expanded. The tradition of the cave can be traced to Justin Martyr, writing in the middle of the second century. Um, and yeah, I wanted to go through this article a bit as well. First off, just his intro offers some suggestions for where our, some more ideas of where our idea of the nativity come from. So he mentions this same um, emphasis narrative that Bailey mentioned. And then he says, artistic depictions of the manger scene, um, which began in the fourth century, reenactments of the nativity story first documented in the 13th century. Um, these are where we, you know, uh, there's not much said in the actual gospel text, so of course when we get artistic, we're going to add um, add to these. Like she says, this isn't a bad thing. It, um, it enriches our worship and impresses a sense of wonder, but there is still these various depictions of Jesus' birth all carry with them the baggage of embellishment. We want to know what the sort of scripture text says on its own, because then it can open us to other ways to imagine um, and, and different ways to interpret the story. I like um, what Kenneth Bailey, so again, I'm quoting the book we just looked at. Um, Bailey writes, the more familiar we are with the biblical story, the more difficult it is to view it outside the way it has always been understood. Um, I think that's very true, and that's why it's important to take um, parts of scripture that uh, so many years of, of expanding the story um have made it so we don't even quite we don't even realize that it is an expansion from the sort of simple details in the gospel text or or the bible you know the scripture passage um it's important to know um and to question so that we can we can imagine new ways of reading it so let's see what mickelson has to say about this word kataluma um well he mentions of course that uh, most sort of versions have this idea of a cold-hearted innkeeper that rejects the Holy Family, right? But not only is the insertion of an innkeeper a dubious addition to the text, the presence of an inn in the narrative is at all is a matter of debate. Um, he brings up how, oh, and this is something I forgot to explore with us, like being able to look at what different versions of the Bible, different English translations, how they translate this word. Um, he's, he, he lets us know a majority translate it as in, but 
Some other options include things like guest room, guest chamber, guest quarters, living quarters, lodging place, lodging, house for strangers, or a place where people stay for the night. And he, he says, which translations those all belong to? Oh, my, one of my faves, the Common English Bible. Let's see which one they did. Guest room. Good for them. Um, now, what Mickelson argues is that the meaning of Kataluma is critical for determining how Luke meant to portray the circumstances of Jesus' birth. Yeah. Did Luke intend to portray the young family being rejected from a commercial inn and forced to give birth in a stable or something else going on, right? Um, in Mickelson's mind, it's an important thing to, to know. And so I'm going to skip on to... Uh, something that Bailey and other resources I looked at didn't go into detail with, but Mickelson does. How extra biblical sources, um, stuff outside of the the Gospels, um, what how they use this Greek word katalama. Um, first, he talks about how the noun is tied to the verb kataluo, which we talked about. Right, we we looked at that. Um, eventually gained the connotation of unharnessing pack animals when resting or lodging on a journey, right? So um, let's see how Greek literature in the Hellenistic Roman periods, um, as well as the Septuagint, right? So that's that Greek version of the, the, the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, um, and all of that. Let's, um, he digs into those, which I think is fun. So, kataluma is not used frequently by Greek writers in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, but the few instances in which it is used give us a sense of how Luke may have encountered the term in literature during his time period. In these works, kataluma generally refers to a person's quarters or lodg lodgings. These accommodations were often temporary in nature. Um, and so, yeah, I won't go into all of these, but good to know, right, that um, these sort of lodgings are temporary shelters in a lot of um, Greek texts outside of the Bible. And yeah, I'll leave it to y'all to uh, read this in detail if you're interesting, but I do think it's fun. Haha, <laughs> a group of lesbians. Sorry, uh, Island of Lesbos, but I enjoy that. But let's read one more. One other Hellenistic author uses Kataluma in a significant way. In the letter of Aristeas, a group of 72 Jewish elders traveled to Egypt in order to create a Greek translation of the Hebrew Torah. This is the Septuagint we were talking about, right? Ptolemy II, duly impressed with the wise scholars, gave orders that the best quarters near the citadel should be assigned to them. Here, katalumata unmistakably means guest chambers provided by the king. It's about accommodating visitors. But yeah, let's skip to the Septuagint usage. So again, these are the the Hebrew Bible, um, Jewish Bible, Old Testament writings uh, translated into Greek by Jewish scholars. We, we don't know whether the Gospel writer of Luke ever interacted with those texts from above, the, the Greek and Roman stuff, but it's pretty clear that he was familiar with the Septuagint. He quotes from it, and he sometimes imitates its style. Um, and that's something I remember learning in seminary, so you can go look at that source if you're interested in more on that. But yeah, so how the Septuagint uses Kataluma could have potentially impacted how, how the writer of Luke used Kataluma, because he's a fan of the Septuagint. He's familiar with it. And so in the Septuagint, it occurs over 12 times, such as in Exodus, um, when Moses and his family are traveling from Midian to Egypt on the way at the lodging. An angel of the Lord met him and was seeking to kill him. Oh, that infamous text. Oh, that's a weird one. If you're, you should look into uh, what scholars try to make of that, Jewish and Christian alike. It's always very interesting. <laughs> um but yeah, all we know about this ka uh, kataluma is that it's where Moses stays while traveling in the wilderness. An inn-like structure could be inferred here, but it could simply be a tent or a natural shelter where Moses and his family spent the night. Indeed, many verses give kataluma the sense of being a traveler's shelter. Hannah, um, after praying, goes on her way and enters her quarters, kataluma. Several verses in the Septuagint place Kataluma in parallel constructions with tents, 
So that's also good to know. Again, I'll, I'll skip over that, but good to know. And then he talks about New Testament usage, which we've already done. The upper room, guest room stuff the, at, at, at the uh, Last Supper. And then the question, of course, how does this analysis of Catalama's use in other literature form how it should be translated in Luke 2, 7? This examination of other literature shows that Cataluma has an intrinsic vagueness, which allows it to be used in a variety of situations to refer to a variety of things, government housing, priests' chambers, or even lion's dens. Translating the term specifically, with a term such as in, does not preserve the ambiguity Luke favored through his use of Cataluma. There are more specific Greek terms for places like inns or guest rooms. Luke himself employs one, Pandokion, in his parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke's choice to use a broad term should be reflected in translations of this verse. Instead of terms like inn or guest room, a term such as lodgings is more appropriate. So yeah, Nicholson is doing um, this work of letting us know why all of this matters. Why would we look into extra biblical texts? Here's why. Um, and then he dives into a close reading of Luke 2, 7. And that context, he says, will include stuff like Joseph's relationship to Bethlehem, the timing of Mary and Joseph's arrival, and the features of first century Palestinian homes. Um, so then he talks about the timing, right? Does Mary have the baby right as soon as they arrive, or has it been a while? That kind of question. Um, it's possible to to attribute the late-night arrival scenario to post-biblical tradition and assume that Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem sometime before the birth of Jesus. Indeed, considering the circumstances of Joseph and Mary, it might be expected that their arrival and their lodgings would have been planned beforehand. Such arrangements would imply that Joseph had ties with the village of Bethlehem, ties that are crucial in evaluating the meaning of Catalma. And of course, we do know he has some sort of relationship to Bethlehem. That's why they're going there for this census. So let's see what Mickelson has to say about that. Has some commentators suggest Joseph was originally from Bethlehem. That, you know, that's where his family is from or would own land. And that he was only, tra he was only in Nazareth to seek work or get his fiancée Mary and bring her back to his native Bethlehem, right? So he quotes this person, that Joseph set out for Bethlehem because of a tax census is explicable only if he had land holdings there. Indeed, it is probable that it was his place of residence. It also would help explain why Mary would accompany Joseph on such a journey. Her presence would not have been required for Joseph to register. If his home was in Nazareth, he almost certainly would have left the pregnant Mary in Nazareth as he traveled to Bethlehem. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's that argument is indeed plausible to me. I But I really appreciate that this person's like, it's not certain, we just don't know, right? I, I like that there's no, all these claims are, he's hedging his bets. I appreciate that. But yeah, basically, if you read the whole thing, regardless of how strong Joseph's ties with Bethlehem were, he would have been far more likely to stay in a family home than in an inn, thus suggesting the most appropriate translation for Catalama is guest room. Yet, this leaves an unanswered question. If Joseph and Mary were being hosted at a private home, why did Mary lay her baby in a manger? And so then we get to explore Palestinian homes again. Now, Mickelson has an entire little passage that he quotes on a with a description of a common Jewish home. From the literary sources and archaeological excavations, one finds that most houses had at least two stories, and sometimes even three. The upper floors were not always full stories. Sometimes they consisted of single rooms on a roof, or an attic with its entrance from a ladder inside the house. These attics could be used for a member of the household or as a guest room. Upper chambers also served as meeting places for small groups. Numerous traditions from the temple period and later tell of assemblies of sages or heads of schools which took place in such chambers. And of course, we have the Last Supper story, right? Whether or not original plans called for upper stories, it was common to add rooms or small structures to the roofs of houses and to the courtyards as it became necessary. The most, frequently, the most frequent reason was the expansion of a family. A newly married son customarily brought his wife to live in the family house. The father would set aside a room within the house for the couple or build a marital house on the roof. And so, yeah, he says that if Mary and Joseph 
had returned to stay with Joseph's family, like, for good, right, it is possible that such a chamber would have been prepared specifically for them. However, we've got the manger thing, right? No room in the kataluma, that extra side room or upper room. So, the guest room might have been taken by other guests, so they have to stay in the main room. The other possibility is there was not sufficient space in the kataluma to accommodate Jesus' delivery. It could just be too small. Childbirth in antiquity was a dangerous procedure for both mother and child, and it is likely that Mary would have been assisted by a midwife as well as the women of the house. The Catalama of the Last Supper was noted for being large, but these guest rooms likely varied in size. If the room in which Mary and Joseph was staying, were staying was small, Mary would have been relocated to the main room of the house, where there would have been plenty of space for the other women to help her with her delivery. And then we get all the stuff about the manger. So we're finally to the conclusion of this article, um, and I think Mc, uh, Mickelson does a great job of explaining why all this matters, so I'm going to read it too. So first he sort of sums up everything, right? Based on the context of both Greek literature and Luke 2, we can develop a clearer picture of the scene Luke intended to convey in Luke 2.7. Examining how the term is used in other literature shows that katalama can be used to refer to a wide variety of places to stay, and examining its context within Luke 2 clarifies what sort of lodgings the term likely refers to there, the guest room of a private home. Reading Kataluma this way fits with the other elements of the story. It better reflects the immediate context of the verse it is used in, the timing of Mary and Joseph's arrival in Bethlehem, Joseph's relationship with the town, and the realities of first century living than any other interpretation. This reading suggests the following scenario for the birth of Jesus. Joseph, who is to one degree or another connected with Bethlehem, brings Mary to the village sometime in advance of her delivery. They stay with relations of Joseph. When the time comes for Mary to give birth to Jesus, the guest room of the family home has too little room to accommodate the process of delivery. Mary is relocated to the main room of the house where Jesus is born, with, midwi with midwives there, right, and placed in one of the mangers present in the room. This reading of Luke's infancy narrative makes the story of Jesus' birth even less unusual than the traditional reading of the story. Being rejected from an inn and being forced to give birth amid animals gives Jesus a humble yet noteworthy beginning. Jesus is born in desperate and memorable circumstances. But placing Jesus' delivery in the main room of a Bethlehemite home gives him a birth narrative similar to probably thousands of Jewish babies. Nothing about the circumstances is extraordinary. Being swaddled was a common experience for infants, and the most that can be inferred by being placed in a manger is that the home may, not, may have been crowded and there is nothing else approximating a crib available. In short, Luke portrays Jesus entering the world in a rather unremarkable way. Such a reading, though it departs from the traditional exegesis of the, of the nativity, actually fits well the recognized emphases of Luke's inf infancy narrative. Commentators have long noted the paucity, the lack of details on Jesus' birth, particularly in comparison to the lengthier narratives of the Annunciation to Mary, the angelic visits to the shepherds, and the presentation of Jesus in the temple. It is in these narratives that Luke finds the evidence he wishes to portray of Jesus' divinity and salvific destiny, for they provide angels and inspired figures with an opportunity to bear witness of what Jesus would eventually do. Similar elements were apparently not a part of the earliest traditions surrounding the birth itself, and Luke evidently did not see fit to augment them, though later Christians would take it upon themselves to do so. Luke's emphasis reflects what must have been most important for him and for his early Christian audience, not the specifics of Jesus' birth, but what that birth portended for the world. Um, if you're still watching this video, thanks for sticking with it. Um, I hope that you got some cool stuff out of it. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this was the sort of how we, how we find and confirm alternative readings of this scripture text, how we dig into the Greek. If you want more of the so what, why does it matter, how does it impact our theology, that's what I have that blog post for and that podcast episode for. Um, so I'm going to link those in the video notes so that if you want to hear more about, okay, why does it matter that Jesus was born, 
um, potentially born not in a stable but in, in a home, how does that influence how we see the story and what it says about how God moves and interacts with human beings, right? Um, you're going to want to check those places out. So yeah, that's why I link, I'm going to link those. And if you have any questions, if anything in this video was confusing, if it was too much, if you wanted more, um, please comment. Um, let me know. I'd love to hear from you what you got out of this video, what you wished you had gotten out of this video, or your own sort of theology about why you think this, this matters or doesn't matter. Yeah, thank you so much for sticking with me and um, let me know what more you want um, from this little Bible Tools Tour video series. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful new year.